We're back. We're back. I love it. The moment I'm like, all right, let's go, and then blue screen. So it's perfect. Um, thankfully, I had, I had like talking notes too, and I was like, oh my God, did these save? Thankfully, they did. Otherwise, I would have just won it. Cool. All right. So uh, I'm going to not do the camera thing just in case my computer's freaking out about stuff. Um, hopefully, that's okay. Um, but yeah, I'll just dive into it. A lot of what I want to talk about today, after I do a little short intro, um, it's kind of just going to be like a reflection on my career. I'll give you a little bit of history and, and give you some of the like, things that I've learned over my career that I'm like, oh man, this would have been amazing to learn when I was like just starting out or when I was a student or anything like that. Um, lessons that I, I keep with me today um, and still kind of like, you know, impart on anybody that I'm working with or anything like that. Um, so to, to give you kind of just a brief overview, I know Jordan gave a, a, a little intro there. I'm, uh, in a, my name is Sean. Uh, I'm an associate art director on Valorant, um, specifically on the team that's called Premium Content, which is the team that makes uh, weapon skins and the Battle Pass content, all of the, the cosmetics and things like that. Uh, and I've been at Riot for about seven years. Uh, I joined Riot for this project for Valorant when it was like 20, 25 people um, because I had a history of working on mostly shooters um, and in a first person space and that was a new thing Riot was venturing into and they, I knew a couple of people who were there, they reached out and I was like, I, I didn't engage with Riot at all. And this is a, a weird thing for me because I heard, you know, back in 2015, it's like, oh, you, even before that, you had to like really love League of Legends and, you know, be super into it. And I'm like, I hate this game. I think it's super toxic. There's no way I'm going to join this company. And then eventually, right, I, I went, I talked to some people and all that kind of stuff, and I, it grew on me. I was just like, there's something magical here. And it was something that I didn't really know that I was looking for in a company to work for was a place that like just had these values that I was like, oh my God, these, this is exactly what I've been looking for. You hear a lot where people are like, oh, you want to be in a place where people, you know, either the expression is like eat their own dog food, where you're like, testing your stuff and working on your stuff and you're really passionate about your stuff, but also like making games that you want to play. And there's, I, I use the word magical, like there is something magical at Riot when you go there and you kind of get enveloped in this whole world that's being built. And for me, joining Valorant at the time it was called Project A. It's like, hey, cool, this IP that's built a lot of like, you know, history and, and a lot of people love it. Um, yeah, you're not gonna be working on that. And I was like, okay, well, we'll, we'll see. Um, We'll see if I actually end up liking it here. But, uh, you know, naturally, seven years later, I'm still here and it's great. So prior to that, like I mentioned, I worked on Call of Duty. Um, again, I, I've always kind of been, I, not always, but I found an interest in doing like weapons and specifically weapon art, um, like hard surface stuff when I was in college. And so Call of Duty for me at the time was like a really big moment. I was like, oh, this is like my, my second job. And I was just like... I've made it, right? This is the great thing. And I kind of, I spent like about three years on a Call of Duty project. Um, and because of the cyclical nature of Call of Duty, I kind of uh, looked back when we finished Advanced Warfare. I looked back at um, the last three years of my life, right? And I was like, what's the next three years of my life going to be like? And I was like, it's going to be exactly the same, I think. And granted, it's like a different game. It went from Advanced Warfare to World War II, but... Overall, I was like, I can expect probably the same thing. I'm going to get a bunch of tasks, make a bunch of guns. They're going to look cool. My portfolio is going to be great. Like, I wanted more of that. And that was also kind of my, you know, impetus to, to leave and go to Riot. And then prior to that, right, we're going a little bit back in time till we get to the before I was in the industry. I did freelance. Um, I worked on a number of different projects, just like single assets here and there. An Aliens game, Borderlands, a game called Fuse. Um mostly trying to do weapons and hard surface when it came up, but this was like my first job. And so it was like, oh, hey, we need you to do uh, low polys and bakes for heads or light maps for a level or LODs and or level light. Like it was literally just anything that came up. And it's kind of like my foot in the door. And then we go before I'm in the industry and that's college. And this is where I kind of want to focus a little bit on the like where a lot of these lessons came from and, and turning points happen. Um, when I was just starting out, doing 3D. It was actually before I got into college. I was like doing this as a hobby before maybe when I was like 15 when I started. Um, and I actually started by modding games, which is not a big thing anymore. Like now you download Unreal and you just like make your own game. Um, but back then it was like anything from like Unreal 2004 
or anything in the Quake engine, stuff like that. It's just like, hey, grab this asset, replace it. So, oh, I want to make this character go from like red to blue. You get Photoshop and you learn how to do that. A little bit more advanced, it's like, I want to change this naturally for me. I'll go into a bunch of Star Wars references later because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So I was doing a, a Star Wars mod. It's like, oh, you change you know, this lightsaber to a sword or something like that. Um, and that was like my first entry into thinking about like, oh, this could be a thing that I do like full time, like not as just a hobby, but as a, a career. And so when I found out that I could go to school for that, um, I thought that school was going to solve all my problems. It's like, yeah, I'm going to learn everything that I had to learn and, and um, go through that and, and be able to get a job. I found out that like that was just scratching the surface. And realistically, like I still had to put in a lot of the work myself it wasn't just going to be like oh hey you show up and then you get the lesson and then you learn the thing it's like no there's a lot that you have to do there and one of the the most important lessons that i think i i got while i was in school actually didn't come from like anything game art related it was in a, a life drawing class and now when you go through art school it's like okay you have to have some fundamentals under your belt before you just dive right into 3d and um or, or anything digital and so we're doing a life drawing class we have a, this you know model in the room and we're going through and I'm, I talked to the teacher afterwards and I was like I cannot for the life of me draw hands how and the hands feet like it's awful for everybody I'm like how do I get better at drawing hands and the the teacher looks at me he's like well first you draw 100 hands and they're gonna suck and then you draw 100 more hands and they're still probably gonna suck but less than the first 100 and then you draw 100 more and maybe they're gonna get better and then you draw 100 more, and now you actually might know what you're doing. And then you keep going until you hit about 1,000, and then maybe you'll be decent. And I was like, oh, Jesus. That's, that's, it, it sounds obvious, but it's one of those things when someone put it like that, I was just like, yeah, it is one of those things where you're like, you just have to keep at it. It doesn't come overnight. And learning that from a very fundamental perspective really helped shape a lot of what I do or what I did in order to try to either work on my portfolio or get a job or anything like that. A lot of times when I was working on art, I was trying to make it perfect or make it like portfolio worthy uh, or anything on the first go. And there came about the importance of doing studies. And I think traditional artists uh, tend to, to anchor to that a lot. It's like you get a sketchbook out and you just kind of go and, and, you know, do like really quick, like silhouette sketches or, or facial sketches, things like that. I don't necessarily think that a lot of people in 3D, um, in this case, or for game art specifically, do studies. And it's one of those things that I've tried to really impart on people where it's like, hey, you don't have to make, you want to make mechs, right? You don't have to make this like badass mech that articulates and animates in all these cool ways. It's like, go find some really interesting industrial design shapes that are going to challenge your thinking of how to make shapes and just make that. And you even look at like some, some products in the real world, like gaming mice are really, really good examples of like really complex, like kind of almost organic forms that can help you out if you're making a mech. And, and I'm trying to abstract it even more than that, where it's like, you don't even have to make a mouse. It's just like an arbitrary shape that might look like a mouse. And it's those fundamentals of design that I actually realized are more valuable than the portfolio piece itself because those learnings show up in the portfolio piece. And so that's at least how I've decided to, you know, from a very early point, like structure my portfolio is I'm going to do like X amount of practice pieces just to kind of learn. And then I'm going to put that all into practice to make a portfolio piece. And that was how I kind of just through all of college um, ended up working on my assets. I would, you know, make a prop here, prop there, texture study, something like that. And then, okay, boom, I'm going to make an environment or boom, I'm going to make a weapon or something. And at the end of my um, school, when I had a graduating portfolio, I had, I think it was maybe like five or six weapons um, and like an environment that I made. And I got a job a week later. It was one of those things where I was just like, I sent it out to a bunch of companies and first one that hit was like a local company. And I was like, cool, like, this is great. It worked. Um, but it's because I put in that extra effort and it wasn't just like, oh, hey, make these five portfolio pieces. It was do all those extra things to make sure that those pieces stand out. And I want to talk about um, things that that kind of stand out a little bit. Um, and, and first, also, you know, we're, we're talking like this was back maybe 2008 or so, something like that. And just to, to 
identify real quick, like how things have kind of changed between then and now, because things have right with, with regards to the industry. When I was first learning 3d or anything game related, I had to learn it all by reading a book. Right. And it sounds ridiculous, but I'm like, it's not that long ago, but I had this massive like 3ds max book that was like a thousand pages long. And it's like, okay, you want to learn something? Just go figure it out. Like look up in the index. There was no, you know, tutorials all over the site. You, you had like kind of, um, was it Nomen and like bigger sites like that, but like there weren't a ton of things out there. And so you kind of just had to like learn and practice. There's forums like polycount and stuff like that. But a lot of it was very self-imposed. You're learning. Um, now, like you have a very specific niche nuanced question about like, how do I do X, Y, Z in Blender or in Maya or whatever? You can Google it. Someone's made a video on it. Maybe 10 people have made a video on it and things have become a lot more available now, which is good. But that also means that there are a lot more people who have access to this information. And this is a very interesting thing because before everyone used to say like, oh, the industry is super competitive and you're, you know, going up against these people who are crazy talented and have done all this work. It's like now multiply that by like 10. There's so many more people out there who one with just Blender alone can get their hands on a 3D program, put a bunch of stuff together and then make a really awesome uh, portfolio piece that might compete with yours. And it's important to kind of know, like, when you are, when we talk about competing with people, like, what are the things that are going to make you stand out? And what are the things that make your portfolio and your work attractive? And I'll kind of go into that specifically uh, a little bit at the end, just for me and Riot, like what I look for if I'm hiring somebody. But in general, I've always had this rule of thumb, and I don't know where this came from. But Similarly, when I was working on portfolio pieces, one of the things I used to do, maybe this is just out of like, um, I don't know, being self-conscious about my own work, but I used to just like, if I wanted to start a project, I found this cool concept of like a Warhammer axe or something like that. I would go on forums or just Google it or things like that and find other people who have already made that asset. And you go on ArtStation today and it's like anything you want to make, guaranteed there's like 25 other people who've already made it. Um, and in some cases, they've probably made it better than you might. And that's a really interesting thing to point out because for me, at least, I would get in these situations where I'm like, okay, I want to make this concept. I'm super inspired by it. I think it's going to be awesome. And then I see on Polycount, somebody made this same thing six months ago, and I'm never going to hit that quality today. It's not that it's not ever, but I'm like, if I started this today, mine would not be as good. I couldn't let myself make that asset, I had to choose something else. Cause I'm like, if someone ever goes to look for this thing and they see somebody else's, they're going to say, Oh, well, by comparison, this one sucks. Um, and so that was a really big thing that I did was going through and seeing like what hasn't been done. Um, it's hard there, there. I mean, there's a lot of things that haven't been done, but it's just not immediately apparent. You typically end up seeing trends. Um, and that's what I tried to avoid, at least when it comes to general, like props, everybody, everybody in their, in their portfolio had like the standard, like, oh, a sci-fi hallway or like a, a still life that involved like a barrel, a pallet, like stuff, like very simple things when it comes to guns, right. More specifically for me, it's like everyone had an AK 47 and an M4, every portfolio has those. And it's like, okay, cool. I'm never going to do those because I don't want mine to just be one more, you know, splash in the ocean. Um, and you have to be, be very deliberate about the things that you're doing and kind of like look around and see what, what's up in the industry. Um, there's a lot to be said also about when you're making work for your portfolio. Um, and I'm not going to go super deep into it, but there's like this everlasting debate about like, oh, using like actual pipelines and constraints and all that kind of stuff versus just making good looking art. And I think that's what I want to tie back to the nature of how the industry has changed is you have some hobbyist who gets on blender and they learn a bunch of cool, like get, they get all the plugins. They, they with like material nodes and rendering stuff and all that kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, that person who's not necessarily looking to get a job in games may not be looking to get a job in like the CG industry. They're just doing this as a hobby outputs, just a really beautiful image. And that's all it is. You, you kind of just go through and it's like, okay, it's like kit bash parts from like libraries and materials and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, at the end of the day, you just have a really good looking image. And that's, that's the crux of all of this is it's art. It is something that's supposed to some, someone is supposed to look at and be like, wow, I find that inspiring or I'm emotionally moved by it 
or I'm just interested in how you did it. Like that's the goal of making art. The other portion of the goal that I think a lot of people who are listening here might actually um, feel a little bit more is like, you want to get a job. And that's, that's like the difficult part is like trying to express your own artistic self while trying to attract somebody else. Um, and that's where certain things like pipelines come into place, rules that you're following. So people are like, oh, I'm making this environment. Do I have to use trim textures? Or I'm doing this animation or this character. Do I have to like make sure that it can animate properly? Like there are certain aspects of things that like when you are making a asset, um, you have to kind of adhere to certain things that would involve a pipeline that you want to have as a job. Because if you go into a job and you make like the most badass art, but like none of your stuff is necessarily like performant or you don't know any of the technical pipelines or things like that, you're just gonna have a harder time. It's not impossible, but it's one of those things where you kind of have to be upfront with like what your goal is. Do you just wanna make art for you or do you wanna make art for somebody else? Um, neither of those is right or wrong. It's just kind of all about preference. Um, and when it comes to making art for somebody else, we'll start with that one. Um, I just want to use a, a scenario, right? Where it's like, let's say you are an environment artist, right? I'm going to kind of jump all over disciplines, um, not necessarily focus just on me for like hard surface, but let's say you're an environment artist and you go and, and join a, a company. And let's say this is like kind of like a, I don't know, a mid tier company, not necessarily your God of Wars, your Naughty Dogs, but you're making like a, a open world game. You're probably going to be doing something along the lines of like, maybe you're doing some set dressing or maybe you're you know, making some small props that kind of go to a set dresser that end up in a corner somewhere, things like that. And the expectation of output is going to be like, hey, this open world game, you got to crank through a ton of assets in a very short amount of time so that, you know, this doesn't take forever. You need to know shortcuts, right? And that's the, the thing that I think when people are making art for themselves don't necessarily do. It's like cheat in a way. It's like, can you reuse stuff? Can you make um, libraries of things that you're kind of pulling from? Are you, is everything yours, right? I think that's a really big thing that I tend to see from people is that it's like, I have to do everything. I have to make every texture, make every prop, all that kind of stuff. And the reality is when you're working on a project for somebody else, you don't do all that stuff. Um, in an example of, you know, going back to the open world thing, you probably have a team of people who are doing you know, prop creation for things that are a little bit more like specific nuance, just purely procedural textures, uh, or not procedural, but like tileable textures that you'll use procedurally either through terrain or in any sort of material system. You'll have layout artists, you'll have lighting people, you'll have, you'll have a multitude of people, and you're going to be one cog in that wheel. Again, it's not a bad thing. It's just kind of how larger companies work. And it's okay to use that same sort of frame of reference when you're doing your, your personal work, so long as you're highlighting the thing that you did as having value. So coming back to this environment artist example again, it's like if you're working on a portfolio piece and you, you say, okay, well, I want this portfolio piece to showcase lighting and mood and tone and all that kind of stuff. There's no reason that you have to go out and say, all right, I'm going to spend six months modeling out this environment, sculpting terrain, all that kind of stuff. If the goal is tone and mood, you can either download a level, right? Or something like that from Unreal. Um, you can get a library of mega scans assets or, or things like that and construct it really quickly. If the goal is more about like a tonal focus, then that's what it should be. And you don't want to waste your time doing things like texturing when that's not really gonna make a difference. You can do one or two things here, though. but it's kind of just like applying the, the goal to the practice. Similarly, if you're focused on like wanting to be a layout artist, you don't necessarily have to make anything. Like you might have to like figure out, oh, how do I take this texture atlas and then build out like a, a prop from it? But all the complicated props and stuff like that, like as a layout artist, you would never be doing that. Um, and it's just one of those things that I think a lot of people tend to rely on themselves too much, where it's just like, I have to do this. This is my project and I have to show that I've done everything. And it's like, I think an environment artist is like the example I tend to go to because I think they're the ones that think that the most. Immediately when you go outside of that, I'm gonna go to a different discipline now, animation. 
animators don't ever think that they have to model a character in order to animate it. They'll go and get like a rig or something like that online that they can just like the rigs that everybody uses and they're focused on their camera positioning and their timing and their weight and all that kind of stuff because that's the goal. And I think that environment art and general art um, kind of get conflated a little bit where they don't necessarily feel that, that disconnect, the breakdown, because for people who haven't been in the industry or haven't been exposed to like larger teams, just don't know that that's kind of a norm. Um, so it, it's a very long-winded way of saying that like, it's okay to use things like scans, like libraries. It's not necessarily cheating. Um, something that even if you have like friends that you're building a project together, right? You're like, oh, hey, let me take your prop. I'll use it in my thing or you know, give you mine, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's more indicative of of an actual workflow and it helps you get things done faster. And all this to point out that like, this is also how you make your work stand out a little bit more because if you're pulling from a bunch of different places, right? You don't wanna use like only mega scans things or all this, all this and that, but if you are being a bit more resourceful in the way that you're making your work, your work is just gonna look completely different to anybody else is because it's going to have a little bit of like life injected into it from other places and other people. If, and this is like a kind of like a harsh extreme thing. It's like, if you're not as good of an artist, um, in that like your texturing isn't as refined, your models aren't, you know, as interesting, things like that, that's going to show up throughout your entire portfolio. Right. And if you're an environment artist, again, you don't necessarily want like the entirety of the representation of you based on the, um, inability to do everybody else's job, right? You wanna make sure that your one job can be kind of the focus. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to things like that, it, going back to like learning without actually having professional experience, that is where some of these things, like the tutorials that are you know, out there today um, help a ton. It's like, when you see people either have like blog posts or they go, um, they, uh, they make like these tutorials that kind of just are a comprehensive overview of like their t entire thing. There's like one thing I want to kind of like distinguish between how would I say this, like a tutorial and a breakdown. Um, Cause again, back when I was learning, most of the tutorials were step-by-step -step, do A, B, C, D, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now you tend to get more like, Hey, I'm just going to speed through this and talk through my process and show you. And both of those things are valuable, right? The, the breakdown is really good for you to see and be exposed to things that you might have not known before um, in a very quick, digestible way. Tutorials, now that I see, um, there's a couple, but like not many of them take the same form as they used to, where it's like, hey, you're going to be sitting down for 15 hours following this thing step by step, and it's, it's not going to be real time. It's going to be sped up. And we're going to skip through some things, but at the end of it, you're going to have a really awesome looking art piece because we're going to go through whatever it is, making an entire character or making an entire level. We're kind of condensing down like a, a course basically into 15 to 20 hours or something like that. And the thing is, that's a long time. It's a long commitment, but the resource is so, so valuable that you have to utilize it if you're going to dive into it. And what I tend to see a lot of people do it's like, oh, I'm going to load this tutorial up. I'm going to skip around because I kind of know this thing or I know that thing. And I'm not actually going to do any of the work. I'm just going to like look at the tutorial and just kind of watch it and be like, okay, I've absorbed this knowledge. I can do it now. And it's like, no, you need to follow these things step by step. Um, my early work, I think, even when I was in college and, and starting to go through, was like all tutorial work because I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, right? And even if I do have an idea of what I'm doing, there's other people who know better or know things that are different. And so I'm gonna use these as a way to learn. Same, same way as like just being in class and, and kind of um, going through a lesson there. The only difference is that at the end of this work, right? I finished this tutorial, I have this amazing prop. And at the end of it, this work is not mine. Um, I, Sam just put this question in there and that's, I had this like at a very early note in my, uh, in my, my note section. Tutorial work is not good for a portfolio. Um, and this is all of this. 100% of this talk is like mostly my opinion, right? Other people might give you different differences. But this kind of goes back to making yourself stand out. Number one is like if I go on and I look at, you know, if I just look for an AK, right? Number one, something that is already like super common. If I see 40 people 
who've made the Tim Burgles AK-47 tutorial and they've used it or the BB-8 droid or whatever, like anything in their portfolio. I'm like, cool, you've all done this the same. Like this is all a reflection of Tim Burgle's ability to teach you and you can follow steps. To me, that's not a reflection of your skill and capability of executing. It's basically following direction. It's not a bad thing, but it's just not a representation of you. Um, and so I think that's, that's one of those things where I'm like, Portfolios are good to do, not, or sorry, um, tutorials are good to do, not good to put in your portfolio. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier on about studies. Not every piece of work that you do has to be portfolio worthy. There was an artist, um, a concept artist that I talked to just a few years back. His name is Elliot Lilly. And he actually told me, like, I, I looked at his portfolio and I was like, hey, you don't have a lot of stuff on there. Like, you don't really update it that often. What's going on? And he's like, he's like, I have two new philosophies one is like i don't really care about my portfolio like if you want to see my stuff just ask me but number two i also want to put work in progress stuff only on my portfolio not finished stuff because the work in progress stuff shows process it shows thought it shows challenges the finished product doesn't show any of that and a really good example i have of something is uh years ago i knew this person who was working on a creature sculpt and they were they were so intent that this creature sculpt was going to be like the best most badass most amazing scary gnarly creature that that's ever been made right very ambitious and so they everything was going to be done by hand no alphas no cheating right as i put in quotes um and they were super you know how about on this we'll cut to like four years later They've restarted that sculpt like five times or more. They've reworked it and just, just like it, it's never been completed. And if at the end of this, right, I as you know, an employer go to look at somebody's portfolio and I'm like, oh my God, this creature is amazing. It's so incredible. And then I find out it took like four or five years. I'm like, no, that's, that, that doesn't work for the things that I would need you to do I thought I was constraining myself to one thing. I was like, I'm a weapons artist, right? So I, at work, I make weapons all the time, and then I go home, do I make more weapons? And I started to, and I was just like, oh, I'm making like kind of sci-fi-ish guns at work, and then more maybe realistic guns at home. And eventually I was like, well, that's not interesting. Like, I'm not necessarily learning, I'm just getting more reps, which is good. Um, but I really needed to find something that interested me that I could just really dive into. And it's not that work wasn't interesting. Again, it's Call of Duty, it's great. But when I, as I mentioned in the very beginning, like I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and I was just like, let me try making some things that are from Star Wars that, you know, I've been inspired by games, movies, books, all the kind of stuff throughout the years. I just wanna dive into that. And the moment I did that, and I started working on something that I was super passionate about, immediately the quality bumped up, the productivity bumped up, um, the way people noticed me bumped up. Like I was posting work in progress stuff all over the place and people were like, wow, this looks really amazing. And I'm like, it's not even done yet. And like, you could see the passion that was in the work because I was doing it for me. And that's what I kind of bring back to when people are even making a portfolio, um, again, to attract another company. Some people might take the perspective of, oh, well, I'm gonna, I wanna work at Naughty Dog. So I'm gonna make this like, Naughty Dog style environment, or I want to work on Halo. I'm going to make these like sci-fi vehicles and stuff like that. And it's like, if you're, if you're doing it for the sake of like, I want X company to notice me so I can get a job. It's not to say that you won't have that same level of passion, but if you're, if that's the primary driver, it's not going to be there. And you can tell it's a very weird, arbitrary thing that when you're looking at someone's portfolio, you're like, eh, they were just doing this just because versus someone's like, oh my God, they, they really poured their heart and soul into it. Again, it's art. You can kind of feel it in a way. Um, and so that's just one of those things that I generally advise people is like, people ask me like, oh, what should I put in my portfolio? It's like, what do you love? Like, what, what's a thing that you can just like lose yourself doing? Do that. Um, even if it doesn't attract somebody else, people will be inspired or moved by it. Um, and now also there's a very weird thing with, um, portfolio presence. Uh, again, kind of relating this all back to, you know, 15 years ago. Um, you have places like ArtStation, 
I think ArtStation is like the primary um, place. And ArtStation, for all intents and purposes, for me, um, is a place that I can have my stuff organized so that I don't have to make a website. Because making a website is a pain in the butt and I didn't really care about doing that. Um, ArtStation also has this very weird side effect of being a social media platform where it includes likes and comments and all the links out to all the other social media things and all that kind of stuff. And what ArtStation gives you is that same dopamine hit that you know, a tweet or a TikTok video or something like that does when people notice it. And the thing is, is like relating this back to before ArtStation or before CG Hub or anything like that, you had your own website and you, didn't, you never knew who was looking at your website, when it was being seen, how many people per day, all that. You just threw that stuff up there and then hope someone noticed. And that was kind of just like the reality of the situation at the time the visibility is so much better now because of a thing like ArtStation or, or CG Hub prior to that. But the thing I think is being missed in a lot of this is the aspect of sharing. Because before, people would share their work either on a forum or in like some uh, MSN message board or, or message chat or something like that with the sole purpose of getting feedback. Hey, here's my final product. Let me know what your thoughts are. And typically what I tend to see on ArtStation is someone posts a thing, you go to the comments and it was like, great, awesome, this is awesome. Oh my God, this is so cool. How'd you do it? What's your poly counts? All that kind of stuff. I feel like it's, it's maybe a faux pas to go into somebody's you know, art station that they posted where they got like a thousand likes and a bunch of comments and be like, hey, I think this could be better. Or I think you can improve on this. But that one thing, depending on who it comes from, is so much more valuable than all of the, the likes, the praises, and all that kind of stuff. And I've even had to an extreme, like people say like, oh, hey, like the last thing that I posted on my art station got 100 likes and then this new one only got 50. Does that mean it's bad? It's like, no, that just means that less people felt compelled to hit a button. Like it, none of that means anything. But if somebody that you posted it to, you know, gave you feedback on it, take that, take that feedback and say like, oh, hey, someone actually took the time to write a comment out or, or tell me something that's going to make me better. And I think a lot of that, we get anchored to the, the likes, the views, the, the things like that as a way to validate a thing. But I think, again, it, it comes down to, and I think actually, if it's funny enough, ArtStation did a new thing where they, it's such a bizarre like algorithm thing that they've done where they, they basically put in a situation where it's like, your stuff will end up in a trending post based off of not the number of people who like it, but like the quality of people who like it. So it's like someone who has like 60,000 followers likes your thing that weighs more than like 100 people, right? So I don't know, some weird like that. And, but they're specifically doing this to like not manipulate, but like make it so that the social media aspect of it is super present. In general, things like this, like Discord groups and mentorships and all that kind of stuff, that is where like the visibility for your stuff matters the most because the people who give you feedback, if it's professionals or anyone that you're getting mentored, mentored by um, like peers and things like that are going to be real with you. They're going to not just say, Hey, this is great, but they'll say, Hey, here's how you make it better. And that's, that's so, so valuable. And that I think has been the one thing that I always had trying to go from one job to the next or just level up. So I always had like a mentor or someone that, you know, I was either working with or someone that I reached out to on, on LinkedIn or something. I was like, Hey, can I just send you stuff from time to time? Just this one person, right. Can make all the difference more than like the, you know, thousands of people who might see it on art stations. Um, cool. Let me just go through my notes make sure. Yeah. There's a bunch of questions I'll go through here since, uh, we're running on time, but I do want to go through, like I mentioned, uh, before just to kind of touch on, um, like making yourself um, hireable, I guess. So like when I'm looking for people, like I open up a job, right? And this is just purely me, purely Riot, doesn't um, reflect everybody in the industry. But say I open up a job and I get in a week 50 applications to that job. Um, there's going to be some of the obvious things that you weed out of like, hey, this is a mid-level role or even a senior level role. 
if you see someone who's a junior, just it's a it's a pass, right? But if we go more, yeah, mid level, I think is the most. You know, you get a little bit of bleed over on either end. Let's say I open up a mid level role, and I get a junior that applies to it, and that junior has a Tim Burgles tutorial uh, piece in their portfolio, a, a piece of their own that has a very clear quality difference, and then maybe some other things that they had done like years prior or something like that. Um, it's going to be very apparent that like they're probably not ready to do the thing that I that I would need them to do. Now, if you have another person, right, equal professional experience, but in their portfolio, I see assets that are made with different programs or assets that have different themes tied to them, or even just like things that are unique and creative, right? It's like, oh, hey, yes, you could have pulled this from a concept, but oh, here's something I tried to design myself. That extra level of like branching out is the thing that's way more attractive to me in a portfolio than just like, oh, hey, I made these like 10 realistic guns or I followed these tutorials or whatever the case is. And I'll give you an example. I have a, an intern right now who, when I interviewed him, um, is after seeing his portfolio, he's like, all right, he's got some solid stuff. After interviewing him, I was like, so tell me about all of these things that you've made. And he's like, well, I, I wanted to do each new piece with a new program so that I could learn what I like and don't like about those programs and learn the, the effective workflows. So he made a knife in Houdini and he made a, something else in Fusion and then something in ZBrush and Maya and Blender. And I'm like, that's incredible. Like you are unprompted challenging yourself to learn things outside of your comfort zone. That alone, like even if the quality of his work wasn't as good, that mindset is more of an attractive thing for me to, to bring in. Cause then I can say, hey, skill gets better over time. Like if you come in and you're like an okay artist, we can make you a better artist by just giving you a lot of work to work on and just reps make, make you better. But that kind of mindset isn't necessarily something you can have the luxury of training on the job. So if someone shows that through their work, it's immediately more compelling than someone who has like really just awesome visuals in their portfolio. Um, I, I tend to really like, uh, we use this term at Riot called T-shaped. Um, people who effectively can do more than one thing. And I know I mentioned before about the whole doing it yourself thing. It's not to say that you have to do everything yourself, but having a knowledge of other people's workflows such that you can change your own to pre kind of prepare for it. So in the, the character example, in the animator example, it's like if a character artist has no idea how an animator animates and what a technical artist needs to rig, they, they might just make a character however they want to. But if you do that with the conscious effort of like, hey, someone's gonna be taking this afterwards and I'm doing my work considering them, it just makes your work a little bit better. Same thing goes for this term T-shaped it's like, if I just know a little bit about somebody else's job, maybe I can even do a little bit of somebody else's job, which is, again, an insanely valuable thing. And I'll, I'll bring this back to like weapons and stuff in the, on Valorant. Um, most of the artists, if not all of the artists, the weapon artists on Valorant, rig their own weapons. And you might have other companies where you go to pipelines and it's like, hey, take your thing, pass it over to a technical artist, they're going to rig it. But these technical artists who are rigging are busy with faces and creatures and stuff like things that are really complex. They don't need to take a bone and map it to like a bunch of geo that isn't going to deform. That's a waste of their time. If you can learn how to do that, it makes one you that much more valuable because now you know a new skill and it saves them, you know, from having to do these kind of mundane tasks. So that's that, that term T-shaped. It's just again, branching out, going deep in your own discipline, but then also broadening out from that. And that's also a super valuable thing. Um, that's a, a very big thing that we actually look for at Riot that makes people um, a little bit more attractive in their, their portfolios or not. Um, I'm kind of going all over the place with a lot of this stuff. I see a bunch of questions and I know we've got like, I don't know, six minutes. I'm good to go a little bit over since I started late from all those things. I want to just uh, go through some of these. I'm going to start at the top and see what I can kind of go through. Uh, starting out for 3D generalists who's focusing on 3D modeling, texturing, animation, is it worth learning Houdini for that extra spice of effects? Um, 
Is it worth learning Houdini just for that? No. Um, is it worth learning Houdini just to see what's available? Yes. Um, I saw a portfolio or graduating portfolio project from this group of students at a school called New Edge. And they made this demo. Um, it was like a outdoor kind of like icy environment, kind of Tomb Raider inspired, but there was these like caves that you go into and they had these like bulbous, like flowery kind of like creature plant things all over this cave. And they, they showed uh, pictures on their uh, portfolio of like the high poly, effectively high poly sculpts of those. And I was like, oh my God, these sculpts are great. And they're like, they're not sculpts, they're all procedural. I was like, what do you mean? And they show me like the Houdini breakdown and every single one of those like plant things was made as a procedural thing in Houdini. And it's not, it wasn't for effects, it was for a model. And because they did it in Houdini, they were able to make like tons of variety of them and it, they all look unique. I'm like, this is really incredible. Uh, Houdini has a lot of powerful features that some people are starting to incorporate into their workflows. Um, and I think we've kind of just tapped the surface of it. But I would say it's, it's a beneficial tool just to learn because procedural stuff, again, cuts corners, makes things faster. It's not cheating, it just makes you more efficient. Um, let's see. Concept artist. When I first tried out scans in Unreal to set up a scene before painting over, felt so self-conscious. Uh, writing up a storm calling me a cheater. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what I was talking about. It's not, right? It's when you're first starting to learn to draw, like you're gonna trace and that's okay. Um, it's the same thing. It's like people will do this in Blender well, that where they will block out a bunch of um, primitive geometry just to get the perspective right. And then they'll start painting over it, right? It's almost that same argument could be made for like a concept artist using photos in their concept to make texture. It's like, oh, you got to do it. You don't have to do it all yourself. Use the resources that you have. Um, uh, yeah, people say that using scans is cheating. It's not, uh, again, mostly my opinion. Um, the, it goes back to the tutorial thing. Just don't claim it as your own. Um, I did the portfolio tutorial one. Traditionalists complain about taking advantage of techniques. Yeah, and that's, again... Everything, everything that has advanced in this industry has been for the benefit of efficiency, right? So even when you look at um, a tool like Substance Painter, right? Compare that to how we had to texture, you know, I want to say even 10 years ago before Substance came out, 15, whatever it was, everything was in Photoshop, right? And now you look, oh, Substance, it has these material values already dialed in for you. That's cheating. No, it's not. It's just inefficiency. Um, following a tutorial, giving it your own touch. That's good, right? And so some, some cases people might say like, oh, hey, I'm gonna get this tutorial. I, so I used to teach uh, a course at CGMA and the, the main workflow course that we had was like modeling a revolver. And people would take that, uh, the ideas from that workflow and then make their own gun. It wasn't, hey, go model a revolver. And so from that perspective, it's good to follow tutorials and kind of making it your own. You're like still following a guide, but you're not doing like one-to-one. -one. And the literal, like the very literal version of tutorials, again, comes back from when I was reading books. And it was like, put this like object at this exact coordinate. And it's like, that, at that point, you're not learning. You're just following steps. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Texturing a prop differently compared to using an environment concept. How can we generate ideas when we're not particularly involved in any client projects? This is an incredible question. Um, idea generation is so difficult. It is, it is probably one of, like, that's why concept artists are so valuable because they can think in ways that other people can't. And, and not that they can't, it's that they can express that thought in a way that other people can't. Um, a lot of idea generation it really just comes from visual library. It's the things that you know, that you've seen, that you are familiar with. That's why you typically tend to see um, studios and like companies that are in different parts of the world tend to make things that resonate with their region of the world because it's what they're used to. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like very simple, just like reading, watching movies, watching you know, TV shows from, from other countries that are in different languages, um, 
kind of going outside of your own comfort zone of like where you get creative ideas from. Uh, one of my things that I actually got really turned on to um, are these things called SCPs, um, source containment protocols. It's like this whole like Reddit online fan fiction kind of universe that's been made over the years. And listening to some of those, I'm like, holy crap, my eyes have just been open to like these incredible creative things that I never would have even thought of that just like, even now I'm like thinking about some stuff and getting chills. I'm like, they, they go to a place that like my mind was never capable of going to. But now that I listen to those, I'm like, when I'm starting to think of ideas, I'm like, wow, what if I take it from this approach? And now I have all these crazy things of like, oh, I want to make these like weird, weird creepy things. Or it, it, it comes down to like where you're getting your sources from and diversifying that is, is really good as much as you can. I used to be in a situation where I'm like, oh, I don't like anime. And then I started watching anime and I'm like, oh my God, anime is awesome. Now I have all these cool ideas from anime. So it's just expanding. Um, would you recommend improving general drawing uh, slash digital painting skills for 3D art? It's not ne necessary. Like you don't have to be a good traditional artist um, to be a good 3D artist. Fundamentals do come into play. Um, certain things like color theory, or uh, if you're um, not even composition, perspective, all that kind of stuff, like things like perspective, for example, you get digital cameras to take care of that stuff for you. But composition is a really big thing that you would have to learn from a traditional sense, um, whether it's 2D or 3D or whatever. And then same thing with color. Color is the thing that I, I think I see people mess with, mess up the most, where it's like your value ranges are not attracting your eye to the right thing, or maybe everything is very monotone or all that kind of stuff. Um, oh, cool. Replying. Uh, replying to the last Houdini question. What is the spreading yourself to the powerhouse learning curve? Um, oh, is this in, in regard to like how deep do you go versus how broad do you go? Um, I tend to always say Go deep on one thing first and then start to spread out. So if you're a generalist, right, you want to stick within like a generalist or a general range and not be like a total generalist. So you don't want to be like, oh, well, I do characters and environments and creatures and textures and animation. It's like, no, get one discipline down and then start to like go out of your comfort zone there. If you're just like a hard surface modeler, um, yeah, the general advice would be get really good at hard surface modeling before you start trying to do like a creature or something like that. Um, any value in learning the old processes that have tools to make them much easier now? So that's a really interesting thing because um, the, the, the short answer to it is not really. Um, Workflows are so similar now that it used to be like you would have a very, very different workflow if you were like texturing in Photoshop versus making a procedural material in Maya versus rendering in Octane versus V-Rate. Like all of this stuff is now so similar to one another. And that actually makes it easier to bounce around between software. Um, funny enough, from my own perspective, I, I was like, hey, my substance painter license expired when Adobe, you know, did their whole transfer thing. I was like, I don't want to pay for a new one. I am just going to download Quixel Mixer. It's a free tool and dive into that. And I was like, oh, this is the exact same thing as Substance, like 100%. The workflow is the same. The, the output is the same. It's just the tool is different. So it's like, do you prefer one company's pencil or another company's pencil? It's all kind of the same thing. Um, When looking for tutorials, like using the teacher's key presses are so useful. Yeah, that stuff helps. Sometimes you're like, how the hell, you know, I, I, some of the better tutorials I've seen out there are where people will say, hey, here's a file that has all of my hotkeys. Um, and they kind of pass that to you. Um, would you rather be good at just painter and kind of good at Photoshop, but not use Photoshop? Yeah, I mean, Photoshop is still very good for general use, right? There's, there are. As much as Substance Painter is a painter, it sucks at painting. Photoshop is very good at painting. Um, there's 
you know, at Riot, you know, I don't know how many artists still you do this, this um, workflow, but a lot of the, the character artists on League of Legends for a while would use 3D coat to, to texture because you can actually do this uh, projection method where you take a snapshot of your image um, or of your model from a certain angle, it exports that out to Photoshop and then they just paint directly on the model as a 2D image in Photoshop and then that gets brought back in and reprojected onto the asset in 3D coat. And it's just Photoshop's painting tools are, are just insane. And so even if you're trying to like just do something quick and simple, like I still use Photoshop's pen tool and like vectors so I can make like really cool like alphas that I can use as decals that I bring into substance. So it's good to kind of always have both in your back pocket. Um, SCP stuff. I think that's all I've caught up with questions. That's kind of all I got. I know it's a long kind of ramble. All right, let's see. What's the last, last one? Why is there no love for Kenan? A friend of mine calls him a stupid rat. Um, Houdini or mastering Maya plugins? Um, well, it, it depends. So, I mean, the same could be said for Blender or Maya or Houdini or whatever, right? I think that kind of goes back to the, the same um, thing I was saying about Substance in Photoshop. It's just a tool. Um, Houdini as a procedural thing is going to do way more for you than Maya or Blender or ZBrush or anything ever will. And there are things that it won't be able to do that those other programs can. And you always have to just kind of be adapting your workflow to what's necessary. I used to be super against that. I used to say, I'm going to do everything in, I used to model in Max. Um, I'm going to do everything in Max. I poly model everything and, and um, make sure that my, my subdivision stuff is super clean. Eventually, I realized that Maya was a faster program. Not a better program, it's faster. And I was like, let me try you know, transferring that workflow over to Maya. And I was like, cool, eventually I could phase Max out. And I'm like, cool, now if I mix a little bit of Maya and ZBrush in my workflow, it'll get even faster then. And then if I, you know, when I'm going to Substance, if I just like use libraries that I've built up over the years, then it's, even, it's all about getting faster um, and doing things that are more complicated that you just wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So it's, it's not necessarily like one is better than the other. It just, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, there's certain things I would never dare try and do in Houdini, like hard surface stuff. Um, but if you're talking about like organic procedural generation, yeah, all day. Would a T-shaped description of an aspiring environmentalist involve having knowledge in something like VFX? No. Um, I think T-shaped for an environment artist, um, the broader, broad aspects of that, I would say, goes into uh, lighting is like a huge one. I think that a lot of environmentalists don't necessarily have a huge grasp on. And in some cases, like Naughty Dog, right? You have lighting artists. Um, they, it's their job. And knowing a little bit about that can actually help a ton. Um, depending on what kind of environment artist you're going to be, like if you're going to be more of a prop creation person, a layout person, a texture person, like it's just dipping into somebody else's area. But something as broad as VFX may not be as useful. Marmoset's amazing. I still do all my renders in there. Um, when creating a portfolio, is it better to have a variety of work to show off wider range of skills? Uh, is it better to focus on one such as realism styles? That comes down to the thing I was saying before. Do what you want to do. Do the thing that you love to do. If you love stylized art, do only stylized art. Because if you do realism in your portfolio, yeah, you might attract a company that's going to have you do realism. Maybe that's not what you're interested in. Maybe that's okay. Maybe you're okay going to a company, making realistic art, and then coming home and doing stylized stuff on, at the end of the day. It's totally on you, but my general advice is just do the things that you love. When it comes to wider range versus like deeper, I tend to say go wide. Um, this as a person who has all guns in Star Wars on their portfolio. Um, do things that showcase a different set of skills for each thing that you're doing. Um, so if someone, if you going to the very literal gun example, it's like, if you have like a Glock and then an AK, okay, they both show me the same thing. They both show me that you know how to model and you know how to texture, but is the difference between them big enough? Not really. 
Uh, has Riot ever hired people who are fresh in the industry or even students? Do you always look? For... Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so like I said, I have Valorant right now has three, four, four employees that were interns over the last like couple of years. Um, one's a concept artist, two are VFX artists, one's a producer. Um, and they were hired from their internship directly out of school. Um, there's no, there's no like, hey, you have to have this much experience um, kind of thing in there. Um, obviously, like I said, know where you are. So if it's like, hey, there's a senior position open and I'm a person who's fresh out of school, you're probably not going to get that job. Um, but junior positions open. They're, they're a little more rare, but um, they're definitely there. Um, yeah, Riot has like a specific job level that exists where it's like you're basically, it's, you know, if you number it like one to five, and so one being like the lowest in that case, um, it typically indicates people who have uh, little to no prior experience, and that's totally fine. Someone not in school as a requirement for internships. Is a portfolio enough now? Uh, if this is a question around like, do I need to go to school to get a job? Um, I'm going to have a big caveat on that one and say no. However, if you're applying for a job internationally and you need to immigrate to a different country, usually having a bachelor's degree or something of that is required. Um, but if you're working, say, if you're in the U.S. and you uh, are applying for a job in the U.S., if you don't have a bachelor's degree or school experience, no one's going to care if your portfolio is good enough. <laughs> 